Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Year of Slaughter, Ireland's Other Great Famine. The Great Potato Famine of 1845-51 to 51 is one of the most famous and defining moments in Irish history. Around 10% of the Irish population died in these horrific six years, while millions emigrated to escape starvation and disease. While this famine may be the most well-known in Ireland, sadly to say, it is not the worst in our history. In 1740, Ireland endured its worst recorded famine, when in the space of 21 months, somewhere between 13 and 20% of the island's population died. This podcast is the story of Ireland's other great and somewhat forgotten famine, known as the Year of Slaughter. At a political meeting in Kilkenny in 1848, during the height of the Great Potato Famine, several speakers took the stage to address a crowd on why Ireland needed its own parliament. The final speaker was a certain Reverend Miley, searching for parallels to the dire situation in Ireland in 1848, Miley recalled events of a hundred years previously. He said, In the years 1740 and 1741, so disastrous were the ravages of famine that it has left its horrors imprinted on our language, being called in the dialect of the people, the year of slaughter. It's recorded in our history that the dead were so numerous that they had not the hands to bury them. This year of slaughter, which the Reverend mentioned, was not only analogous to the Great Famine of the late 1840s, which he was living through, but it was, in fact, worse. Beginning on December 30th, 1739, and lasting until September 1741, it was the greatest disaster to befall Ireland since the Black Death of 1348. The untold horrors of this year of slaughter or, as it was known in Irish as Blian an Ar, was triggered by ferocious weather, or rather, a sequence of dire weather, the like of which has not been seen since. On the night of the 29th and 30th of December, 1739, Ireland was battered by a storm from the east, and it brought with it about six weeks of ferociously cold weather. Rivers froze solid, Mills ground to a halt and, if records in England are anything to go by, indoor temperatures plunged to minus 12 degrees Celsius. One can only imagine what external temperatures were like. This, however, was only the beginning. When these freezing conditions eventually broke in mid-February and Ireland began to thaw, an equally unusual weather system followed. Through the following months of spring, conditions were cold but extremely dry. Then snow was recorded in May, while the summer was equally poor. By October, the Baltic conditions of earlier in the year returned before a desperate storm ravaged Ireland on December the 9th. Following this, cold temperatures plunged Ireland back to a frozen waste. Eventually, in mid-1741, the weather improved very slowly, bringing these bizarre and as we shall see, lethal conditions to an end. While in the 21st century such weather would unquestionably cause mayhem, and no doubt there would be a few casualties, what happened in 1740 to 41 was unimaginable. Each different type of weather brought with it its own disastrous side effects, which created what can only be described as a perfect storm in terms of natural disaster. One compounded by human indifference. When this strange period of weather began with six weeks of freezing conditions in early 1740, it was initially greeted with merriment. Frozen lakes and rivers were a source of amazement and indeed there was a long tradition in Ireland of hosting festivities on frozen water. As early as 1338, a fair had been held at Dublin on the River Liffey when it froze. So, unsurprisingly, in 1740, festivals were held across Ireland. The freezing conditions also brought with them some very unusual features in the landscape. 
lakes and rivers became routeways rather than barriers. Journey times were cut drastically as people could now walk across the frozen lakes. This ended in tragedy in Mayo when a funeral cortege travelled across the frozen Loch Corrib, but the ice broke and six people were drowned. However, it was increasingly clear that as the freezing weather dragged on through January, that fatal consequences would be far more widespread than this isolated tragedy in Mayo, particularly after this dire weather damaged the potato crop. The potato was not a native vegetable to Ireland. Indeed, it was only brought to the island in the late 16th or early 17th century, when the English began their conquest of the Americas. While its early history is obscure, by 1740 it had become an integral part of the diet of Irish peasants. Its prolific yield and its ability to grow in relatively poor soils made it an ideal crop. However, it, like everything else in Ireland, was vulnerable to this incredibly cold weather in the first six weeks of 1740. The potatoes in the fields, and indeed seed potatoes yet to be planted, were destroyed by the severe cold. While this was not an immediate disaster, it guaranteed severe food shortages later in the year, when there would be little or no potatoes to harvest. However, in early 1740, more immediate concerns revolved around heating houses. No doubt many people were at risk from hypothermia. In cities, the situation was particularly dire, given the lack of nearby natural fuel such as wood and turf. During the worst of the weather, coal ships couldn't come from England, which served to push the price of coal up massively. There was little aid from the authorities. Indeed, 14 people were even arrested in the Phoenix Park in Dublin when they were gathering firewood. This, to say the least, was perverse given that the Phoenix Park is over 1,700 acres in size and there was plenty of timber to go around. The most immediate side effect of this cold appears to have been the widespread death of animals in the fields, which in itself was a serious but not insurmountable calamity for the country's peasants. However, worse was to follow. While the freezing conditions were alleviated in mid-February, the weather remained cold and also dry. Indeed, these arid conditions continued through the spring of 1740. While early in the year the population had suffered unbearable cold, as we have seen, in April and May several towns were ravaged by fires due to the incredibly dry yet windy conditions. The worst of these fires in Carrigan-Shore burned 140 houses. As the high summer approached, the dry but cold conditions began to affect the crops in fields. This, coupled with the severely damaged potato crop and the loss of many animals due to cold, did not bode well for the future. By the late summer of 1740, as the crops failed, famine was beginning to set in. Wheat doubled in price and chaos followed. While we often associate famine with people starving to death, starvation also brought with it massive social upheaval. The poor in rural areas began to leave their homes and beg in cities where they hoped they might find food. However, this led to a crisis in cities. Riots began to break out as desperate people broke open warehouses in search of food. Through the later months of 1740, the weather improved very little and indeed by December and the following January, Arctic conditions had returned. This led to what can only be described as I mentioned at the start, as a perfect storm of death, disaster and disease in early 1741. Starvation wasn't the only killer. Typhus, smallpox and dysentery, known as the bloody flux, swept through the countryside, killing thousands. In County Clare, the farm diary of the wealthy Lucas family recorded just some of the impacts of these horrific conditions. In January, Many farm labourers did not turn up for work due to the severe cold. Even when they could make their way to the farm, work was difficult if not impossible. Ploughing was completely unfeasible given the land was frozen solid. Several animals on the farm also died, presumably due to a lack of fodder 
The Lucas Diary represents the wealthier echelons of Irish society, but even they were not untouched by the death that came with the year of slaughter. On January the 18th, 1741, the Farm Journal recorded the first of six deaths, that of the foster father of the journal keeper, who died from dysentery. Despite these horrific conditions, people still had to go and sow crops and farm the land as best they could. For labourers, this must have been agony, as their emaciated, malnourished bodies engaged in arduous labour. But to have any hope of surviving, they needed a good harvest in August and September of 1741. To make matters worse, the planting of these crops took place as Ireland was surrounded by constant death at this stage. Many accounts recalled how people were completely overwhelmed by the sheer volume of deaths. While the cause of this crisis had clearly been natural, the situation was, in many ways, worsened by the political and economic situation in Ireland and, indeed, the responses of the country's ruling classes, as we shall see next. In the 18th century, Ireland was riven by numerous tensions, the most decisive of which was the explosive mix of religious and class tensions. The elite of Irish society, powerful landlords, despised the vast majority of the population, the peasantry, seeing them akin to animals. Now this hatred was magnified by a sectarian divide where most of the peasants were Catholic and that most of the landowners were Protestants. This hatred had explosive ramifications when it came to trying to alleviate the famine in 1740. Indeed, those with the power and resources to help out the starving peasants were found severely lacking. The initial responses in early 1740 were directed only at urban areas, and in particular the artisan class, to whom the rich were more economically dependent. It was clear from this that they would continually put their narrow interests first, regardless of the cost to the wider population. When, in August 1741, an embargo was placed on foodstuffs being exported from Ireland, it had little to do with the starving population, but instead the supplies were being preserved to feed the British army, then at war with Spain. When, in late 1740, relief efforts were organised on a wider scale, we could scarcely use the term humane to describe them. They were all largely private affairs. In Dublin, the Archbishop of the city organised a relief scheme where food was given to the starving of Dublin, but only those who were from the city. This left multitudes who had come to Dublin from the barren countryside in search of food in dire straits. Such policies were replicated across the island. In rural areas, relief was left up to individual landlords, so unsurprisingly, this was a very mixed and varied response. Indeed, if the diary of the Lucas Farm in County Clare mentioned earlier is anything to go by, many of the wealthy didn't really care much for the peasantry who were starving to death. The Farm Journal, while mentioning deaths from dysentery, doesn't once directly mention starvation, which was a problem the rich could buy their way out of. Indeed, if people in County Clare were dependent on help from the like of the Lucases, they may have well had to wait a long time. Starving peasants weren't a priority for such people. The Lucases perversely seemed to have taken advantage of and actually benefited from the famine conditions. Between January and April 1741, they were able to cut the wages of their labourers from five pence per day in January to three pence in March and then to two pence per day in April. This was in a period when all foodstuffs were soaring in price. But the Lucases were in a dominant position as their labourers were desperate for work. Ultimately, the alleviation of starvation and suffering came not through aid, but through an improvement in circumstances in the summer and autumn of 1741, when the harvest was bountiful. While it's widely recorded, many celebrated, there was no doubt many too who were not in a festive spirit. Few can have escaped without death touching their family in some way, shape or form. While there was no accurate data collected at the time, historians have placed the death toll 
between 310,000 and 480,000. As you're trying to grapple with these large figures, it's worth factoring in that Ireland's population in the 1740s was only somewhere in the region of 2.5 million. So this figure represented a death toll in the region of 13 to 20 percent. Such death rates were unheard of then and thankfully haven't been replicated since. Even during the Great Famine of 1845 to 51, around 800,000 people died, but this was in a population of 8 million. And these horrors took place over six years, while the cataclysmic year of slaughter in 1740 to 1741 lasted just over one year. Sadly, at the time, there was little analysis or attempt to alleviate any of the underlying human causes which had contributed to the disaster. While one theory argues the ferocious weather of this period may have been caused by the eruption of the Shivluk volcano in Kamchatka on the Pacific coast of modern Russia, in Ireland the adverse weather conditions had a disproportionate impact when compared to other countries where the weather had been similar. Among the many contributing factors was the vast inequality and contemptuous attitude of the island's ruling classes, both mercantile and landowning, to the poor. In the aftermath, such attitudes were never challenged in a coherent way and if anything, many of these attitudes just hardened in the following century, contributing to the calamity that was the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s. Finally, it's probably worth dwelling for a moment on why so few people have ever heard of the Year of Slaughter. I think it's partly down to the fact that there was very little emigration in its aftermath and so the consequences were largely limited to Ireland. The situation was very different a century later when the Great Famine of the 1840s triggered mass emigration which established Irish communities in the United States and Britain, groups which would become highly influential in these countries. Emigration, and in particular emigration to the United States of America, had been very limited prior to the year of slaughter, so it probably wasn't seen by many as a viable way to escape the carnage. A century later, the story would be very different in the late 1840s when the potato crop failed. Don't forget to send me your suggestions for future episodes or your thoughts on this show to Irish History on Twitter or Irish History Podcast on Facebook. Until next time, slaughter.